start recording using OBI Studio here. Excellent. Okay, so we're going. So the goal for today, what I was going to present on as we start the first day of the open source microfactory startup camp. First of all, it's the first time we're talking about enterprise very explicitly during one of our events. We're at the phase of we've done prototypes a ton for the last decade. Right now it's time to talk about collaboration towards people making livelihoods, real livelihoods coming out of open source collaborative development, uh, which is missing. People don't know what the hard open source hardware economy is or could be. So we're going to begin with collaborative literacy. How can you get a large number of people to collaborate on development for the common good, getting tr past the scarcity mindset? So. Uh, the first thing to, to talk about is define the terms. What, what are we talking about when we talk about colla collaboration? For the purpose of OSC, we're talking about not a dozen people, not even a hundred people, but we're talking about to scaling up to a thousand or more people who can meaningfully collaborate for rapid development that's cheaper, better, faster, <laughs> ends up in, in the things that are developed that that are competitive with what you can uh, do today in today's economy in a proprietary way. Just like software has completely crushed the scene and shown that you can do this with collaborative software development between thousands of people. Uh, Linux right now has about 4,000 people that are pretty much full time. Now in Linux, the situation there is they are getting paid. Uh, so that's uh, right now, uh, uh, some of the latest on Linux is that most people are transitioning from doing Linux as a volunteer thing to companies like Microsoft and Apple and Amazon supporting them, Facebook. Everybody's supporting it because they know that, that collaboration is better. So why is it not happening in hardware? That's the next frontier, and that's what we'd like to put a dent in the universe on in terms of making that more accessible to, to hardware. So the first thing is we're asking how do you get many many people not just small teams but very large teams effectively collaborating and specifically on product design because at the end of the day it's about creating an economy uh, a livelihoods means about what do we do for a living so can we transform the world towards open collaboration so so the scale is thousands um what tools All do we right. use? yeah <laughs> so, so that's that's a beginning but with that comes a particular tool set way of thinking so it's mindset first and a tool set that allows that to happen. So the mindset that comes from that, uh, I won't talk about uh, that yet. I'll start with practical tools. The fact that today practical tools do exist for massive, massive collaboration, like Wikipedia using, using wikis and other tools. So we're saying, okay, well, what can we do for open hardware to use the techniques that projects like Wikipedia have done to do our work? So what tools do we use? We use a wiki which has been demonstrated to show, uh, demonstrate that thousands of people can collaborate real-time, almost real-time on a development like Wikipedia. So we start with that, the wiki. Um, if you're going to coordinate a large number of people doing work, you have to find those people's works on, a, on the wiki. So what we do at, specifically at Open Source Ecology is everyone keeps a work log uh, so I'll just talk about, I won't necessarily talk about the mechanics of how we do this, but just the, the concept so you can see how this collaboration fits together. We have uh, work logs on the wiki, so I can show you an example. Let me actually share my screen uh, to show what a, what a sample work log looks like. So I, I can go to my work log. So I embed, basically it's a uh, time, it's date, you know, work log, Saturday, November 9th. So already you can see what I'm doing there. Uh, today I'm doing open source microfactory startup camp and there's a link to it. So the key to a work log is that you log so that anybody else on a team can see what you're doing. And you're putting the links on there as you go so that you're essentially working openly. That means that um, if you're in a distributed, bunch of distributed locations, you know, you can, you can effectively act like you're in the same room. Because you can, if you cannot talk to that person, you can still say, oh, okay, here's my log. I'm, I'm recording all that I'm doing with work product specifically for what I'm doing so that anybody can, can see what you're doing. Now, that goes back to the four very basic principles of open source, which says that open source work is open to be viewed. There's four freedoms of open source. 
you can see the thing, like open source software, you can see the code, you can use it, you can modify it, and four, you can sell it. Yes, economic freedom is a critical fourth freedom that's defined in the open source software definition. And if you think about those four freedoms, that's kind of how we operate on the wiki. Because if you publish it, someone can see it. If you publish, so that means a link, a hyperlink, the concept of a hyperlink. This is Tim Berners-Lee, right? Uh, we create the World Wide Web with things that are hyperlinked so you can find anything uh, anywhere. You, you can, can review it. You can use it. So, for example, if you're, uh, for particularly for hardware development, how do you use it? Well, if it's a file for, say, a 3D printable object, as, a, as an example, you can actually use that file. You can download it and use it. So there's the freedom to use. Now, third, what, how do you include the freedom to modify on the wiki? Well, if you can download the file, you want to download the source file, which is going to be in FreeCAD. You can open up open source FreeCAD software and you can edit it. So now you've gotten to the third piece, which is modification. So you can collaborate, you can modify, and you can upload back to the wiki. And you can move on to the fourth freedom. If it's a good design, if you can use it, if it's usable, then you can sell it. That's how we operate. I, I am documenting stuff on my wiki so that people can take that info and make a living out of it. That's what we do in open source. It's based on open, the four freedoms of open source software. And we're trying to do that exact thing with open source hardware. Now the wiki, when you think about doing your wiki work log, which, is, which we encourage every team member to do, then you can actually manifest those four freedoms right on a wiki. So that's a, that's a very powerful concept of how we use these tools in practice. Uh, any questions so far? Let's keep rolling. Um, okay, so say, say we're into scalable collaboration. Uh, how do you, th there's details on how do you manage all this information so, so that it's findable and people can use it. So let's talk about uploading a, a CAD file. So let's go to a sample page on the wiki, say the, the page for the 3D printer, right? What I'm going to explain to you right now is how do you keep track of versions of files that can be edited by a thousand collaborators? So we're talking, once again, back to scalable. How do you do that? Uh, how do you keep uploading it and re-uploading, downloading without getting into conflicts. You have to have a basic understanding of how that works. Now, in the wiki, there's actually a very useful tool called version history. So, here's what we have. So here we have the print. Uh, you can see, can you no. see my stuff? No, no, no you can't Stop see sharing. the screen. Like okay, well, I am sharing, but I guess it's internet bandwidth that's preventing you guys from seeing it. So I am recording this so we can all review this later. But okay, say you go to the D3DV 1906 page on the wiki, uh, which you can go there, you guys. Um, we upload files as we get them done. So for example, D3D Final Assembly, I click on that and there's gonna be the file. D3D Final Assembly, right here, it's a free CAD file. What you'll see, and this is a very important, this is how versioning works on the wiki. What you can do when you scroll down to the file history, there's gonna be, these are all the files that have already been uploaded from March 1st, to June 25, you can see like 10 or 20 files. Uh, then below that, there's an upload a new version of this file. That is the critical feature that we use. So what happens is, we'll say you download it, you modify it, you wanna click then um, upload a new version of this file, and this will be tracked here. It will give it a timestamp. It will give you who uploaded that file. You can add comments there. But that's a way to keep track of files with collaborative editing. Now, the critical thing there is, as soon as you have any result, in order to minimize conflict, to say the more people you have working on this, the more conflict you're gonna have in terms of someone trying to upload to the same file, right? Because this is like, um, you know, you're not locking anybody out. It's open to complete collaboration so how do we negotiate that you don't have conflicts? 
there's two things we can do about that one is you upload as soon as you can like as soon as you made like a significant change maybe you got to one step could be 15 minutes it could be an hour just upload it memory is cheap uh, just do it uh, though there is a limit of uh, one megabyte for the FreeCAD file so in other words if the file is actually larger than one meg you got to go to another place like github or some other file repository we can upload larger size files but we actually put a limit of one meg because if we have one person each person upload a file and we've got a thousand collaborators that's a gigabyte per upload if everyone did one upload so that gets into exploding your you know the memory requirements on your <laughs> on your uh, server so that's why we're limiting to just one meg per file. That seems like that's troublesome, but it's not if you use the second principle, which is modular breakdown. So, so one of the key topics of how software has succeeded is they work very modular. You can have a little chunk of code. Code is made up of many, many chunks of code, and you can break it into s simple little modules. How does that work in hardware? Well, in hardware, we do the exact same thing. And you can break things down to the smallest parts possible. So, for example, for the pre 3D printer, you obviously have major parts like the frame, the axes, controller, extruder, and so forth. But then you can take each of those and further define that, divide them into submodules. The extruder has a heater element, a fan, a stepper motor, thermistor, and so forth. So, right there, if you do proper a modular breakdown, what you'll see is that, okay, well, say we're collaborating on a 3D printer, which is what we're doing during the startup camp. First of all, you can have 12 modules. And so if you have 12 people working on an individual module, you could completely eliminate all edit conflicts because you can just divide by the, the people that you have. But then you have the 12 sub-modules, so right there you already have 144 parts that you can edit collaboratively each person working on that module and how do you handle that complexity you do what is the part library on the wiki so here if you notice this for the 3d printer uh, I'm on the d3d 1906 page you can go to 3d printer genealogy to access it uh, but you have a visual gallery of parts so visually if you say you broke it down modularly and properly, you have 12 modules, maybe 12 sub-modules. So like you can have up to say 144 visual representations. If they include a picture, which we upload here, you can visually scroll through this one page and immediately in a click of a button, download the source of those files. And that requires some project management because then you would have to say, okay, how do we divide this? If we have a hundred people, working on it, um, you want to do role allocation. So you'd have to have some mechanism for doing that. The simple tool we use, without getting into too much details, we use Scrummy, uh, scrummy.com. You can do, you have to have some basic form of project management. But the mechanics here are, if you break down the machine into many, many parts, each person can work on a single file. And for each file that you click on, like the frame right here, I click on that, and there's a bunch of versions there that, that say, uh, a bunch of people wanted to collaborate on that, they would download the latest latest uh, frame file. And why is it important to upload? I keep on reiterating that just upload it ASAP. And that is for the reason, if you upload it ASAP, then say you've got many other collaborators on it, they will be able to work from the latest version as fast as you are. So don't block it by saying, okay, well, I'm going to upload it tomorrow or when I'm finished, that completely does not work if you're talking about a scalable collaborative process. So if you're talking about, I mean, you can do that, but think about how much time you will have wasted or potential time of other collaborators who can be helping you. And that is good for you because you think, unless you're really ego, high on your ego and think, oh, I got to do it myself. No, then of course you accept the help from others but in order to accept the help from others, the first thing you do is do the first freedom, which is publish, first freedom of open, open source, the idea that someone else can view it and then modify it and make money on it. 
<laughs> sell it or whatever. Um, so that's how it works. The basic version of history, that functionality already exists within the wiki. So use that. And the wiki has proven to be completely scalable. The one of the largest projects in the world called Wikipedia uses that. Mm -hmm. So there's no need to look for complex solutions. The solutions are here already. We have to use the tools and use them in a creative way, adapt them for our purposes. But a lot of, we, a lot of times we get into these debates on, oh, now we need the killer app for doing the, the open source GitHub for hardware. Well, combination of the wiki, work logs, embeddable documents, you can use some GitHub for software, but the point about GitHub is it's not the solution, or Git is not the solution because software is only a small part of the entire project. So a lot of people say, well, why don't you do your project on GitHub? It's already got built-in version history. Well, yes, it does, but we're much, much, much more than just code and software. And of course, you can do some other things in GitHub too, but the wiki is actually more effective at it uh, because you can really manipulate it very well. It's got search you know, all kinds of features that enable broad-scale collaboration. Okay, so the next, uh, next item I want to cover. So I, we talked about version history. We talked about work logs. So say you have 100 people, each person has a work log. And for example, how do you coordinate all the different uh, people working on a project? I think an effective way would be to say, just start a gallery. Here's a... Uh, uh, gallery, just like we treat modules for machines, well, the modules, the, the human being modules, uh, can also be treated like the machine. You can put a gallery of all the people collaborating, and you can click on their log. You can perhaps have a picture of their face in the gallery. That's a tool right there we can pick right off. Uh, no need for a complex project management suite. You got it right in the wiki. So that's a way to do it. Um, okay, let's talk about next about embedding things in the wiki because part of the, the challenge of open hardware is that you got all kinds of media, multimedia, pictures, videos, uh, other assets um, that go. So, so it's very useful to do a thing called embedding, embedding HTML code on a wiki. Like for example, actually going to our excellent 1906 page. And 1906 is quite representative of the kind of content you should have on the development page. But the first thing we've got up there is an HTML embed of the printer, thanks to Michel here. Uh, we're going to learn more about that. Uh, that's an HTML. Okay, I'm actually yeah. going to mute. Uh, uh, mute. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so we've got embeddable content. Embeddable content such as 3D uh, manipulable WebGL embeds that are explodable. Uh, which is, we're doing state-of-the-art on that here. It's right here with Michel at Open Source Ecology. Uh, we can do that. We can embed things like, what's very convenient we found is Facebook. Everyone uses Facebook. And what I actually do is, um, when I build something, I just take pictures, upload it to Facebook, and just embed the whole thread within a, within a wiki page. It's actually very convenient. So that's another thing you can embed. Uh, you can embed different... Uh, cloud editable docs such as Google Docs, we use Google Docs, they're not open source but there's no excellent solution that works as well as Google Docs right now so we're still using Google Docs. It'll come up in the open source pretty soon but it's not there yet. But you can do collaborative editing of documents and I will show you one example. Let's actually get into this as an example. I actually want to do this hands-on um, except for people driving here but um, let's go to the page on the wiki um, which is called Sandbox. So opensourceecology.org slash wiki slide slash sandbox. In it, you have an example, so please navigate to there, a page on a wiki called Sandbox. And by the way, let me just explain wiki nomenclature, uh, the, the, the URL. The explicit URL is HTTPS colon slash slash wiki.opensourceecology.org slash wiki. Okay, that's like if you go there, you end up on the front page of the wiki. So any page that's on the wiki will follow the slash that's after the wiki in the URL. So when I ask you to go to a page called Sandbox, you go to slash wiki slash and then Sandbox. 
and there you go. So you'll get to a wiki page called Sandbox. So, so each page, you can start an infinite number of pages on a wiki. It's scalable. There's no, like, by the way, the wiki, uh, the concept of a wiki, um, if you're not familiar with wikis, please study what that is about. It's essentially a platform where an unlimited number of people can edit without, you, all you have to do is log in. Um, on our wiki, you have to log in to, to edit. You can also set up a wiki that you don't need any permissions to, you don't need to even log in. You can have anonymous contributions, but you would tend to get spam on that too much, so we, we have a login, so you just get an account on the wiki. Um, but you can create an infinite number of pages. Anyone can edit any page. You do not need anyone's permission. It's one of those things that the proactive person uh, wins or proactive person. It's it's for people who are creators. It's like you can edit anything. You can uh, collaborate. Multiple people can edit the same page. However, you can get into edit conflicts. If you if two people are editing the same page, you will get a conflict. So you need to uh, pay attention to that. Um, but since there's so many page, pages there, you sometimes I, I hardly ever get into any edit conflicts. But the more people you have the more conflicts you can have in just editing wiki pages. So that means that at that time it's important when you're working on a big project that you have division into modules and sub-modules and different phases of the project. Like each project goes through like, right now we have a simple template of 20 development steps. So you can break it down at those development steps. So. Uh, what I mean to say is that there's a lot of different steps. If you have a large team, you can still handle it because of the module of breakdown. But you do have to be aware of the con concept of an edit conflict, where if you click save, it will say, oh, oops, somebody is editing this as well. You So you have to kind of resolve that. Now, that's why Google Docs are actually much more friendly. And I'm showing you the example with Sandbox. So Google Docs are what we embed within them wiki and i won't tell you the details of that you can google that <laughs> how to embed google docs with html but this is a google doc that's embedded and in order to access it what we do typically is under the doc we you have an edit link so click on that so you click on an edit link and you actually end up not editing the wiki this is editing the google doc and whatever you change in the google doc will appear on the wiki because it's an embedded document so that's how that works uh, so now I'm seeing that there are two other people within this Google Doc, so that's right. Uh, and the idea is you can start editing, so why don't you do that? So uh, click on the text, the T that stands for text, and say, hi, my name is Marchin. Uh, so what I'm showing here is that, so you guys do that. Um, I just added Marchin, hi, my name is Marchin to this doc. I could add pictures, copy and paste pictures. This is a picture that's copied and pasted. You can do simple designs with different shapes. So you can do basic diagrams and timelines, project planning, various kinds of things. Um, uh, it says uh, I have to have like... Request that. So sorry. Good, good point. So under any doc that you create, so I just created this doc, uh, you have to go into the the share setting. So upper right corner is a button that says share and in it anyone on the internet now can find and view it but they can't edit. So I'm going to go to advanced settings and change that to public on the web which is the top button and then access anyone no sign in required can view, can comment, can edit. Select the edit. Save. So I just did that. Done. And now anybody can edit this document. And that's our default at Open Source Ecology. You might think, oh, well, if you make it openly editable, you get a bunch of spam and whatever. Well, it does not happen. Well, actually, we haven't had, ha had that happen yet. Um, if there is spam, the, these documents also have version history. So in file, you can go to version history and you can go see version history and you can uh, see the in here in the right hand side here shows the different versions but if somebody spams it like someone wants to trash you you just go back and click on that click on the last version and say restore this version so this is safe don't be afraid about messing it up if it's an editable doc it should be edited 
So that's the principle here. It's about proactive collaboration. Okay, so that's embeddable Google Docs, and I'll keep moving on here. But that's an important thing. So what that means is uh, if you have an embeddable Google Doc like this, you can add pages, you add slides. Um, you can have a bunch of people. I, I don't know what the practical limit of Google Docs is, but we've had, we worked with like a dozen people. I don't know if it scales to 100 or 1,000. Uh, I guess if you have a good internet connection, you can probably do 100 or 1,000. I don't know. Um, but we'll, we have yet to see how what the limit of this, because we never really had more than like a dozen or two dozen people on on a project at the same time. So, uh, but why I'm emphasizing the idea of 1,000 or more is because just for perspective, in 2020, we're planning on a HeroX incentive challenge to do an open source 3D printed cordless drill made from scrap materials from trash, so it's recycled. But we're going to post that on HeroX, give a big prize, and we expect over a thousand people to participate. So it's that's one of these uh, incentive challenge platforms. But the idea there is how many we'll, we'll really test the limits of mass collaboration as we uh, work on the project in a massive way. So definitely with the wiki, we know we can handle hundreds or thousands of contributions. Uh, on a Google Docs, we haven't really tested how much a single, how many people a single document can have. But of course, if we're working on multiple uh, modules, each module can set up their own, its own Google Doc for, say, a concept design document. So you can definitely, once again, use the modularity concept to have hundreds or thousands of people work collaboratively at the same time. So unprecedented collaboration. Um, I mentioned uh, embedding Facebook, which is a common thing. Uh, we don't care so much at this point that Facebook is evil, uh, but it's a very useful tool, um, and probably other tools might be just as good. So galleries and park libraries. Pretty, Sorry, say it again. Evil too. Who is? But good tools can be used for great evil. Right. Oh, that's a so, good point. Good point that you're making, uh, John. So the point was made that good tools can also be used for evil. So open source can also be used for evil as well. Yeah. So it's really about how you use the tool. So if we're using Facebook to share content openly, that's a great use, and we're cleaning its conscience. So, <laughs> so we're doing a service to society. Um, okay. A uh, couple of last things. Uh, I'll cover taxonomy and free tab. Okay. So taxonomy. Uh, I won't go too, too, too much detail because you can study this. There's a page on the wiki called Taxonomy, okay? But the basic concept is, for taxonomy, is that the wiki has a certain organizational structure. Uh, when you're developing an open hardware project, there's a well-defined set of one development steps. There's a well-defined set of project management steps or just in general product development steps. And if you understand that framework, then you can, in principle, find just about anything on the wiki. So to give you an example, if we have 50 machines in the Global Village construction set, we know that there's a machine name. We know that there's a bunch of modules that each machine is broken into. We know there's a bunch of we have a simple te development template that's got 20 s development steps from, okay, here's your concept design, here's your CAD, builds the materials, build instructions, and there's more steps than that. So you know the, all those things. So if you kind of read the Wiki Taxonomy page and study that, because in principle, so, so with just with the 50 Global Village Construction Set tools, there's 250,000 Wiki pages that will exist. They don't exist yet. We haven't built all the 50 tools, and a lot of it is partially documented. But there will be 250,000 pages. If you understand this taxonomy, you will be able to access any single element of that database, knowledge base, within seconds. To give you an example, you want to build the next iteration of the extruder for the 3D printer. So on the wiki, in a, in a name box, you will type in, so first of all, you have to know what the machines are called, and that's explained. You will type in 3D printer, extruder, 
bill of materials, for example. Bill of materials is one of the 20 items. And if you do that, you should find that exact page. Try it. Now, I won't guarantee that, but here's... Mm -hmm. so, so let's start with a simple one. 3D printer extruder. Does that exist? Well, it should exist if we are following the taxonomy. So does the 3D printer extruder page exist? Chris says yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have a 3D printer extruder page. So that mm -hmm. means someone who's put up that page was following the taxonomy and got it down to that level. Now we could go when people see the, the limit to this is how many people understand this taxonomy because right now uh, pretty much I mean it's this is the taxonomy is based on common principles it's generally accepted nomenclatures and so forth uh, I understand it but there's very few other people that understand it but if you study the wiki taxonomy page the reward of that is you'll be able to access any single piece of content down to any technical level of detail you can get me one of 250 quarter million pages within seconds so study that page it's very important because the collaborative process there's actually no magic to it it's it works as well as the quality of the people doing it and the quality of the people will be determined by do you understand the collaboration tools do you understand the nomenclature do you understand the basic processes of how how this all comes together uh, the wiki taxonomy page is perhaps the single most important organizing page um, for the wiki. Now, of course, a lot of times we, we get a lot of comments from people, your wiki's a mess and so forth. That's not organized. Well, that's an invitation for people to, to organize it. Because for one, um, we don't have dedicated editors. It's an all-volunteer project. For reference, Wikimeet, Wikipedia spends $30 million dollars to have editors for their wiki we don't have that budget and it's everybody's role to do that um, so in other words it's not free launch that all of a sudden the wiki organizes itself no there's a there's effort behind it either people are paying for it um, 30 million bucks which is quite quite affordable for the greatest project in the world right one of the greatest projects public projects in the world that's great um, here for our case the issue is how many people are trained in the Wikiex taxonomy so they can function as maintainers and organizers of, of the wiki. But we don't have a lot of hierarchy at the public contribution level. Please step up to that. Learn the taxonomy. Start organizing the wiki pages. Um, and anytime somebody comes to me and says, hey, it's a mess, well, I'm going to invite them. Learn about the wiki, learn about the project and the taxonomy, and help us correct that because it's a public project so, so anyone can do well so uh and that kind of differentiates the people out there like some people are like oh your wiki's a mess well they need to be educated to to understand that hey it's a public process you can help that um, but that tells you like some people t completely get it they're like oh it's a wiki i know how it works it's supposed to be a sandbox it's supposed to be a mess where people just throw a bunch of information out and that's actually perfectly fine because over time, the quality will improve. That's the, that's the, that goes back to the first freedom, which is called logging and, and documenting, so that you have something to organize in the first place, right? But think about this. Can we really develop massive collaborative projects? Yes, if people understand this, you can imprint. So if you gave me 250,000 people right now, and they all understood the taxonomy and so forth the details I was talking about you can effectively get those people to actually do that there's a there's a software infrastructure where they can simply go edit the pages work in free CAD files and post pictures and create bills of materials so so it does lend itself the point is if we had that understanding among a large number of people this project would be done in a day well, instead to get there, it's going to take us a decade, right? We're in a, into it a decade, and we're planning to finish by 2028, so about nine years from now. Uh, that's kind of the, the big picture. Um, we, we are aiming to finish absolutely to the level of 
working replicable business models behind each of the 50 tools, the ability to build infrastructures like houses, open source micro factories, and entire campuses that are filled with open source technology and infrastructure that's replicable very easily anywhere around the world. So that's, that's the goal. Um, if people understood that, yes, you can definitely have many people working on that. Uh, but right now, what, what we found over the years is that it's not the tools or the feasibility of the technology or anything. It's the social technology. It's, it's what we particularly call collaborative literacy. And that's the name of this, this presentation. It's do people understand, one, the mindset, and second, the tool set for how you collaborate openly. Okay, so next, just moving right on here. Uh, with respect to some of the tools, the last tool and the most important tool is FreeCAD. That is um, the tool that you use in, in hardware. In hardware, you have to talk about physical designs. How do you generate physical designs? You use computer-aided design software. And right now, fortunately, there's an excellent project called FreeCAD. For anybody who's not heard of it, it's a 3D design software that's fully open source. It's fully modifiable. You can uh, use it. You can modify it. For example, if you want to make a workbench, FreeCAD works with it has workbenches. Let me open up FreeCAD just to show people what it's like. Let's let's download, uh, for example, um, say the 3D printer. What what happens here is you go to the D3D uh, page. You download D3D Final Assembly. Uh, it comes on your desktop, FreeCAD opens, you double click the D3D Final Assembly um, and there you go, you can now view the file. So the fourth, once again, going back to the freedom, so you can view it. If you know how to use FreeCAD here, you can modify it and so forth. So this is uh, all about collaborative development. But this tool exists. A few years ago, uh, you know, five, ten years ago, we did not have this. Right now we do. And this is uh, very much sufficient for all that we can do. It's much better than a proprietary solutions in a sense that you can modify this. Like you can create a workbench. Like for example, we have a workbench uh, called, well, I, don't, I don't have it here on this install here, but for example, someone built a workbench for designing ships. So basically it makes the tools for designing ships, like maybe like inserting uh, various features of a ship or whatever. You can design custom workbenches within FreeCAD very easily if you know Python. So this is an invitation to all the software people to, to help develop FreeCAD because you can extend it infinitely. And that's, that's the beauty of FreeCAD. You have complete control over it. It can also be run, of course, if you know how to do it as a server. So you can have that using a thin client, you know, which would be a cool application, for example, for a, using a tablet or, uh, to do your FreeCAD or at least to view things in FreeCAD. But FreeCAD exists, so learn how to use it. Now, uh, is there a big learning curve to it? Well, what we have done is we have a FreeCAD 101 page, okay. and we have been able to basically strip down the, the tool set of FreeCAD. So let's go to the FreeCAD 101. Uh, there's a nice instructor, instructional there. It's the Lesson 3, the OSC Basic Workflow Tutorial. And our claim here is, so it's a start with this video, it's, a, it's like 45 minutes long um, or so. Yeah, it's actually an hour. Um, but in this video, we walk you through the basic functions. So this is one thing, doing the 80-20 the rule, where with 20% of the effort, you can get about, learn about 80% of the functionality of the software. So uh, there's a basic concept here we explain, and the basic workflow works as you draw things in two dimensions using a robust editor, then you extrude those into three dimensional shapes um, in another workbench on FreeCAD, and then you can further modify any of the faces, put additional features, drawings, and so forth. So basically in FreeCAD, you can start with um, 2D to make it into 3D, any type of shape. You can further modify that shape by changing any of its faces. You can further modify any of that. So this video here walks you through the process of how you take, you create a 3D object, you put a feature on that object of any geometry, and then you put another feature on the feature that you created. So, point is, if you can understand that very simple process, you can design just about anything, in fact, anything 
as far as I know, within, well, maybe some of that's 80-20 rule, you can design, be very, very functional in making useful CAD models to prototype with, to 3D print, to put on a CNC torch table, to cut, or whatever. So, uh, go, take a look at that, uh, spend one hour uh, following that video. I would also like to have feedback, like we do have a feedback section like way down, no we don't, do we? Um, please send us feedback. Actually we do have, um, we do have feedback right below this exercise, there's a, uh, this, there's a feedback form right basically to join the discuss this discussion there, but tell me, were you able to do this? We do have some data points, when uh, I did a presentation on this in Spain, five out of eight people after one hour, we're able to do this exercise. In other words, draw a shape, make it into a 3D object, and then put another feature on that shape and another feature on that feature. So you can do that in one hour. So strip all your mind of uh, any preconceptions. I think a lot of people, um, if you're a beginner, you can learn it quite easily. I've, I've seen some people who are professional CAD users that are like, this is weird, I cannot learn it. You know, they're like just resisting because they're used to certain workflows. But if you come to it with an open mind, you can definitely learn this in rapid time. Okay, so that's free CAD, open source CAD. Let's go into a couple more topics. Um, I want to cover a couple more things. Collaborative literacy, the bigger picture of it. Uh, so the start above, so what we've talked about are some of the technical tools, how you can collaborate on a large scale. But what about the mental mindset? Well, the mindset has to revolve around the fact that we can redesign our economy to be open source and collaborative. Right now we live in a world that's proprietary and patented. Um, I would say that in 100 years or possibly even 20 years, we're going to look back at it as a stone age of innovation. I believe right now we're in a stone age of innovation. What that means is, yeah, we think we've got computers, we've got advanced things, but nobody's collaborating. Um, so that's why I call it we're still in a stone age. When, when somebody does something, they work proprietary, another group re replicates that, they start from scratch reinventing the wheel. There's very little in terms of authentic open collaboration, especially when you talk about, like maybe it exists for very simple things, but you don't want to be replicating old things that are not effective or efficient it's most important to collaborate on the cutting edge things and that certainly does not exist so well, the claim here is if people did collaborate on the cutting edge stuff so it's especially publish it if it's really good because a lot of people are like oh well i can be partly open source i can publish my old stuff you know but they'll never publish the cutting edge results but it's all about doing that because then you would accelerate innovation tremendously and I've seen so many examples where you'd think that something would be farther ahead. And I'm, I'm going to actually bring up the case of, I mentioned the diesel engine. If you, if you study diesel engines uh, and go on forums, you will notice that everybody says there is no such thing as a perfect diesel engine. They might like one version or another, and some people have favorites versus another, but no one has all the features that you would like. And I, I, I noticed that, because uh, I think about these things, how do you make optimized things? How do you make things that are better, faster, cheaper, just superior, which we think is the promise of open source, which has been proven with Linux, which is the, has dominated now the world of software, without any doubt. And Microsoft now is the biggest contributor to open source software, by the way. So we know it works. Collaboration works. So why is the diesel engine suboptimal? I think that's one manifestation of the many kinds of examples in today's society where things are just not as good as they can be. So when we talk about open collaboration, we talk about let's make things, everything the best. It should be the Apple computer for everybody. It should, Apple shouldn't be like the one that supposedly has a better product. Why aren't we spreading all that information so that we can move on to other things? Because they're bigger things. There's bigger things like the distribution of wealth, poverty, wars, deprivation of all kinds eco side which is a pressing issue today we were still killing the environment um, we have other issues we need to solve this petty stuff of survival and making a living that's the big vision here and we we have to start with that as a fundamental tenet of what we call collaborative literacy we talked about the tools we've got the wikis and free cats you know we can do it 
but we need the mindset to do that. So what is at stake? <laughs> it's really the next trillion dollar economy. That's what we have to think about. It's a, it's a proposition that's bigger than Amazon and Walmart combined. <laughs> it's, it's the idea that you can collaborate on product design. Uh, we have formulated a concept of what we call the open source everything store. The idea is that people collaborate completely openly on product design and everyone has access to the best design to, to, ha to, to, to participate with the four freedoms of open source up to making a living so that making a living is eliminated from the equation as a, one of the most pressing issues that just about anybody in today's world faces, right? And then for the richest of the rich people, um, it applies to both. It's abundance happen, applies to all. You can't have the, the massive maldistribution of wealth. The, the figures today are uh, about seven or six or something people of the top billionaires have as much wealth as the 50% of the people at the bottom of the pyramid. That's, it's not getting better actually. And if you look at the figures, that is not getting better. Uh, that figure is captured in what's known as the Gini coefficient. It's, the, it's a measure of distribution of wealth. Uh, zero is when everybody has the same amount of wealth as anybody else. One is when one super ruler owns the entire world. <laughs> Uh, that's not good. We're at about 0.7, so close to that. <laughs> so let's wake up. Um, yeah, uh, about 0.7 is where we at with the Gini coefficient. Study that and start making noise about it. So that's where uh, the promise of open hardware comes. That uh, we think that um, we can say that open source software in some way has been co-opted because even though the underlying kernels are open source, uh, still you have the Facebooks and Googles and Amazons, which are still pretty much concentrating wealth. Um, yes, there's been great benefit. People like ourselves, we have FreeCAD and Wikis, that's awesome. But in a balance of things, uh, there's a debate whether how, how better or worse things are getting. And some people you can definitely make a claim that some things are just getting worse. Some things may be getting better. Some point things like, yes, we have a faster computer tomorrow, but uh, we need to look at the integrated big picture scenario. Uh, and that's where we talk about open hardware as collaborative development. So we, open, we, call, we call it the open source economy. What is the open source economy? So we're simply collaborative design is the pattern. Instead of uh, companies getting patents and competing with one another, just like Linux, they share a common pool of open source know-how. They can build value on top of that. It's completely consistent with known economic models. <laughs> it's not really a mystery, but it's just not happening. And that's why we do what we do. So uh, let's talk about open hardware. If we talk about, so let's talk about, say, the open source everything store. In order for a large, so we're, this theme here is collaborative literacy, large scale collaboration. How do we do it? Well, just like we have to have open source software so that uh, everyone can use have access to the same tools. It gets it gets a little more specific. If you're going to produce the same thing and you're going to distribute, you have to pay attention to quality control first of all. So you can't just be making one random thing. Another person in another part of the world makes something and it doesn't meet specs or whatever. If you talk about open product design in an open source economy, you have to have standards. You have to have first of all start with the same hardware, same software. So it's actually important that and so this applies to our project. If we're developing products for the open source everything store, everyone has to have access to low cost affordable equipment to make that happen. So that means the equipment has to be open source. But it's very important that there is that affordable open source equipment because that's the only way everyone will have access to the same tool chain. Otherwise, massive collaboration is simply not possible. Because you can't, like for example, on 3D printing, which many people are familiar with, you cannot just use one printer and a completely different printer with different parameters and expect to produce the identical part. It might have some, some differences. If you're refining that to very, you know, to very tight properties, that means that you are making repli very replicable, quality-controlled products, you have to use the same equipment and same tool chains. How deeply do you have to go? One... Well, first of all, if we're doing massive collaboration, you want to start with the same software, obviously. 
because if you have many kinds of software people will be like oh uh, like I'm collaborating with somebody collaborating with Chris we've got different software well you might not even be able to read the same file with a different software you, you gotta use the same software so you can communicate interchange readily without any bugs so you have to have the same software but also sometimes it, it's very important to have this even the same operating system because the, the versions on the different operating systems might be different for us we actually use OSE Linux it's a downloadable distribution where we make sure that everybody's using the same software so see that can work you can do the different systems but you're gonna run into issues it's not gonna be as seamless if you're gonna try to scale that to a thousand people you're gonna end up spending a proportionally larger fraction of your time troubleshooting differences and little bugs and things that aren't identical so you want to start with the same software same operating systems even same version like if we use Lulzbot Cura you know maybe there's a difference in the old, older version so you, you want to be on the same page on everything and ultimately you'd like to also be on the same computers like right now for example a lot of computers can't run the OSE Linux and get their Wi-Fi to work or whatever so ideally you would get to that level where we've got our maybe like our open source thin client tablet using a BeagleBone or a Raspberry Pi or whatever yeah I mean the more identical you are the more seamlessly you can collaborate so pay attention to that and and that's why we're not emphasizing that you download OSE Linux for nothing that you use Ubuntu or the operating system that we use yes please use it because it's going to be more seamless once we scale that up to, to larger teams and that applies down to even using potentially the same computer uh, it definitely applies to like say we have the 3d printer yes you want to use the same version of the printer clearly um, so there's a redundancy in a tool set so that if I'm talking to someone far away we can be talking about the identical thing and I can get the right answer not like oh mine is different it really won't work for you I don't know what's going on and you waste time no you want to have seamless collaboration okay um, the other thing we talk about for robustness of design and large-scale collaboration is treating everything as a construction set that's a big concept whatever we try to design we try to create it as part libraries construction sets that you cannot only build one kind of printer but a larger one different geometry all kinds of variations and that's that's especially visible uh, with our for example a good example on our wiki is the universal axis so if you go to universal axis on the wiki we have a small it's a CN, basically a CNC motion system so we started with the 8 millimeter version 5 16 inch uh, but you can scale that up and it's, you can see the construction set of very few basic small pieces um, we can scale to larger printer sizes like a one meter printer bed tall printers you can scale the axis itself to one inch rods for a larger application like a CNC torch table you can even go to the two inch universal axis which we've just prototyped recently but this this gets big these are for two inch rods but basically we're using the same kind of design principles but increasing size to make this relevant not just to our 3d printer but even all the way up to high force precision machining so uh, that's the concept of a construction set approach we take that for everything that we do because think about how much more value that provides instead of designing one thing you're designing 10 or 100 different things because it lends itself to all these uses so the value proposition of a construction set approach is huge and I think it doesn't happen a lot because it's harder you know like these multiple one in a one in a like multiple in one tools they're kind of rare these days everyone uses dedicated tools because sim supposedly they're not as efficient if you combine all the functions into one but I, I'm actually thinking that that's a lot about how you design it imagine you were to design it and it's completely robust whether you use it in one function or another that's a much harder problem and I would say that venture to say that the reason why it doesn't happen is not because it doesn't work it's because it's it's a little harder and we just haven't gotten there because we're competing and uh, we're competing on best point performance on one function we're not thinking about the integrated 
ecosystem. We're not thinking about lifetime design or the circular economy concepts. There's actually a great one, Colby Thompson, thank you. He just pointed out this one, like 12 in one tool set. It's on Kickstarter right now. Uh, I'm gonna show that actually as an example. Uh, it's called, uh, where is that? I just wanted to show that as an example of how things that you may not think are possible are possible. It's called Doer. It's currently on Kickstarter, uh, but it's a 12-in-1 toolkit. It's a it's actually someone uh, called me, passed it on to me because it's uh, it's relevant to our 3D printed cordless drill, which we're designing as a construction set. So this thing is crazy. You can do so many different things. Of course, it's not open source because nobody does open source today. Hardware. Um, but that's that's so we're basically going to do the the open source version of uh, Doer, the current project. What is that? Is that just ended on Kickstarter? Um, okay. Well, because it's, it's on Kickstarter as well. Looks like that just ended. They they raised one point one and a quarter million dollars. Um, it's definitely the kind of stuff that we can do in an open source but th this ju is just a proof proof point that yes of course you can have all these kinds of things can somebody design it and make it work well and i could see like i i'm not sure how well doer is going to work in terms of industrial performance which is the thing that we're after uh, i know that we are going to design industrial performance completely into our basic system so just to give you an example how this is called technological determinism it's the fact that there's no such thing as technology has to be a certain way or anything has to be a certain way. Things are negotiable. There's so many different opportunities of how things can go. The technology we have today is not like that because it's the super optimal set. It's just for various historical, economic, political forces, things have developed that way. And it's not set in stone. So that's another call for the open source that we are the creators of our futures and all of us want to participate in that role actively in order to make the distributed open source economy a world that works for everybody not just a few okay so in summary i'm going to start wrapping up this is i think that's a pretty good overview um, but to sum up a few things uh, so when we collaborate in open source ecology first thing to think about modular breakdown if you talk about getting large teams to work on something well, before modular breakdown, you have to have a massive transformative purpose. That's borrowing that from Peter Diamandis, but a, an important problem. You want to select the biggest problems on the wor in the world and solve them. That's where open source and large scale collaboration comes in. So if you want to do some trivial stuff, well, open source is not so important, but if you really want to work on important projects, things that are deemed unsolvable today, you got to do it open source. So you need to start with a massive transformative purpose. You then move on, break this problem down. Modular breakdown. We've seen that succeed with Linux. That was basically Git and email and ability to document that. And the modular breakdown is what created Linux. That's how you can get thousands of people on Linux and succeed. The same thing needs to happen with hardware. Um, Git is the process of version control that software has used in order to succeed. Uh, that's currently the most common versioning system out there as far as I know. Um, we need an open source version of Git. And why not use Git only? I already mentioned that, well, we have much many more assets than, than traditional Git software like GitHub or GitLab can do because software and just basic data structures are only a small portion of what we do. Now, there's also a second, second reason for that. I'll get into that just a little bit. Is the idea that when you're cloning a project to start on another project like just the memory size of an entire project using the git protocol becomes unmanageable with hardware is my claim see because with software you clone a project and you're talking about lines of code 
don't take a lot of memory. If you're talking about hardware, a complex design, the memory sizes get huge, especially if you include pictures, video documentation. G Git. G-code gets huge. G-code files are enormous. I'm not that part of it. Yeah. And, and Chris says that G-code files get huge too. That's for 3D printing. So the kind of protocol that Git uses, the, the way they do it, is really unmanageable for hardware. We definitely need more. So what is that magic solution? Well, I've alluded a bit to it, but our solution right now um, is with the wiki. So with the wiki, we have, uh, I'll just mention this uh, since this is important how we work, in terms of development template. On the wiki, there's a page called development template, and those are the, basically the, the main development steps that we go through. In particular, there's a simple development template. If you scroll down, simple template. It's got about 20 items. So whatever we design, this is the overall process we intend to follow. You start with requirements. You study the industry standards. You propose a conceptual design. You do modular breakdown so you can have a large team work together. So the modular breakdown is particular to scalable development. You absolutely have to have 3D CAD. That is the most critical aspect. So if you had nothing else, but you had the 3D CAD, that would be the best start perhaps. You can have calculations, you can have electronic design, wiring and plumbing diagrams, software. So software, number nine, it's one of the 20 items that you need. It's 5%, let's say. Then you move on to, to builds of materials. Build, build material. We like to do visual builds of materials where you attach pictures with hyperlinks to them. CAM files are the production files that come out of CAD. It's computer-aided manufacturing files. Cut lists, that's basic things you do when you're actually building something, you gotta cut things into pieces. That's, you gotta document that. Now you get into the build, build instructions, fabrication drawings, exploded part diagrams, production engineering. Production engineering is important, that part where uh, you wanna, if you're documenting, like, like the production engineering would be impossible if you've got a bunch of different tool sets with, with, which provide different results. Like the settings will not be the same, the procedure for how you use the machine might not be the same. So that's why, once again, reiterating the idea that you need a degenerate tool set. Degenerate meaning you're collapsing that into here's your package that you use so you get the same results. Degeneracy is the concept there. So then you get data collection, so build pictures and video. Obviously, that's how you document things. You can do more formal data collection, like here's the, the, the power this outputs, the torque it gives, the actual size of the product it makes, like for the brick press, the size of the bricks it makes, whatever, uh, various specs. And then future work. You want to also make suggestions for future versions. But that's the, the main 20, 20 steps. So, okay, so that encapsulates the main taxonomy. That's, I talked about this in the wiki taxonomy. So you can, this is related, this is discussed in the wiki taxonomy page. But uh, this, in principle, contains all the data, all the source code required to build something. So the source code in hardware is not the software. Software is the source code in software. In hardware you have many more things. If you were to, so getting back to Git and version management, how do you manage this so you can, you can keep the next version consistent? And we've struggled with that and what you'd notice is that initially the wiki sprung up, we got these nice pages, relatively organized, and then all of a sudden it all collapses because people make new versions and you don't know where to put them because you have so many different pages. How to do it? Well, what we do today typically is we start, and it's dis discussed in the version, versioning, how we version things, but you basically, for the 3D printer, you would do 3D pr printer V19.11, 1911. That's the current version we're working on right now, so um, that would be the version. But how do you call it? So you start that page on a wiki, uh, 3D printer version 19.1911. So, so 3D printer should get you, one of the critical things that should get you is the, is the genealogy. You can see all the versions. But if you know what you're looking for, you can go to the 3D printer version 19.11. And in it, you would embed this simple template. You can embed it as a Google Doc or you can actually embed it as wiki code. We have a template in both, actually. So then you can uh, basically cloning a project is as simple as embedding that on a new project page. 
Done. That's the Git for open hardware. Now, how do you update the content there? Well, if the new version uses the identical content designs as before, well, you can leave that. But for the parts that change, you would upload new versions. So this is basically a memory free, like it's, it's, it works well on the memory aspect. Uh, it's, one, it's just one way to do it, but uh, for us it works well right now. Just copy the development template from the last version, use it in your current version, and simply change, like if there's a link to uh, the design, you change that link to the new version of the design. And this development template can occur on the level of the whole project, of submodules, and so forth. So study, study how that works. That's the idea of how do you, the, the problem of how do you do Git, the, the versioning and hardware, uh, study the wiki taxonomy page and understand how the sim simple template works in order to make that happen. But in summary, I think, I mean, it's a kind of have to think about it a little bit, but the concept is rather basic. Copy the old development template change the stuff that changes and that way what happens is the project remains consistent you know which information goes with which project because for example i think we, uh, the rep wrap wiki might be notorious for a bunch of versions you don't really know like because it's so many people collaborating you don't really keep track of version history so so well uh, but you will find it difficult to find which page goes with which version of a machine if you embed the entire template, you're linking to all the relevant content automatically, and you can manage that. So you can change the individual wiki pages, um, but if that wiki page changes for, like, start a new page if you start to make, make changes. Because that way, the old page remains for the old project, and a new page remains for, uh, starts for the next project. So it's, you have to think about it a little bit, kind of understand it, but it, it does make sense. Okay. So, yeah, we, did, we already did the real-time editing experience. We had the, the WorkDoc sandbox. Hi, my name is Marcin. Michelle is here, too. So the point is, a lot of people can document. There's no limit. You can, if you break down a project into multiple uh, working documents and modules, you can have many, many people uh, collaborate. So we've kind of gone through that. And then um, the endpoint is massive scale parallel development. For us, uh, there is a particular goal too. Like we talk a lot about educate a business model based around education, production, experience. So we're really getting into the experience economy. What we do is we do a lot of teaching, but it's not just any teaching. It's very much applied to to real open source products. So. So we like to think about it, we, we're engaged both in production, in education, and we sell that as an experience. You know, that's the revenue model we do. And that's a, that's a model that allows for widespread collaboration. Uh, we make it easy for people to gain access to, to physical survival and wealth and so forth. So that model's working for us, we're trying to, to spread it. Um, spread around the world. The particular way we're, we're aiming for, like right now, we, you still see that, um, I'll go cut the screen sharing right now, but you see, uh, uh, as you see here, our infrastructure still is very basic and we're, um, the goal for us is to create a state of art center for open source product development. So basically the idea of a campus, a campus where you have education, you have production, you have integrated agriculture, it's like a, like a university campus where people live there, they work there, there's production. It's like, think about transforming the existing cookie cutter development. Like in America, you've got the 40 acre cookie, cookie cutter developments. There's a new thing coming up that's called agri-hoods. Developments, they're building agriculture into their infrastructures. So you have local food, that's awesome. We like to take that further. We want to say, okay, this is agriculture, but there's, we found pretty quickly here that there's much more to life than agriculture. <laughs> you need much more than that to create a real community. So you want to build in the next aspects about innovation, prosperity, thriving, growing as a person, uh, creating a real infrastructure for that. So we're thinking, or at least personally, I've shifted my thinking a lot from, okay, now we're, 
uh, we've done a lot of prototypes and heavy machines and infrastructure building activities, but it's time to make this place pretty and attract people and, and grow the movement and make it replicable. Because right now, yeah, it's, it's been skunk works for a long time, but I think right now we're really transitioning to thinking about it. What makes it really world-class and attractive? So for example, like with things like our brick press, we want to do our nice, beautiful patios in front of the Hab Lab and, and retaining walls and just building up infrastructure, building up um, to what it takes to make a real nice community and framed around the business model of an education center or a university campus. That's kind of what we're thinking about. And that's what we're inviting everybody in the world to do to, you know, to, to help develop a construction set for any kind of infrastructure. We're talking about, you know, our OSC campuses spread to many places as places of economic development that rebuild their communities here in sweet Maysville, Missouri. If we don't change our community here by bringing in local production, transforming agriculture, making tractors and products that people use here, we have not done nothing. So we got to start right here. We'll demonstrate that here, that it's doable. And other people can also replicate that, that elsewhere. Uh, and then you can do, uh, use the construction set approach to do anything. Some people are talking about Mars habitats or whatever other application uh, you can think of. It's, it's all relevant. Um, actually, we're talking about going to Hong Kong. We're currently negotiating the, the 3D printer that actually builds, 3D prints the f from dirt, from earth, stabilized earth, cemented earth, print, printing housing. So things with applications for both Mars or Earth right here, based on a universal axis. Once again, the construction set approach. So um, construction sets, powerful. So join us. Uh, we're, we're here in a startup camp right now. Um, join this project and, and help us do this. It's all about collaborative de development to create the next economy, the open source economy. So that's about it. Uh, main, main concepts about collaborative literacy. Any comments to wrap up here or anything else? Any questions, John, anything? Yeah, I think that's, that's kind of like the base, the, the, the main point to get out of this is how to use the tools that already exist. They're all out there. We don't really need anything new. We just want to use what already exists, use it in creative ways uh, by shifting our mindset to what true collaboration is. And that collaboration must be with thousands of people just like Linux has done. So and we have to do more. Our hardware is more complex, so we have to do probably more people than in software. So large scale collaborative par parallel development made possible by open source. So with that, I'll wrap up here. Uh, we'll publish this for anyone to review and please send comments below in a video uh, if you have any questions or comments about this. If you want to get involved or have suggestions on how we can do this better, we're all about learning. So thank you. We'll talk to you soon.